Good morning. Good morning. Happy Fourth of July and welcome, welcome, welcome. I see a lot of flags and red, white, and blue out there. It's a glorious day to be in the house of God together and celebrate God's freedom and to celebrate our friendship and love of God and each other. And to that end, I would love for you to stand and give a handshake, wave, or whatever you're more comfortable doing and say welcome to this place. We're so glad to have you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> if you're uh, visiting with us, we have little connect cards that are in the pews. We'd love for you to fill one out just so we can say a special howdy and hello to you. Uh, we have some announcements today as well. Uh, this week, look for those of you who have interest and connection to our children's ministries. We're going to be sending out uh, a communicate to you about a meeting we're going to have about forming the, the, the new look and new direction of children's ministry. So I want you to just be in the, on the lookout for that. Next Sunday, we're going to resume what we used to call and will continue to call Common Grounds. And that's our coffee time at 10 o'clock in the morning downstairs in our fellowship hall. And next week, we will not have a teaching during that day. We're just going to get back together and, and reconnect on that uh, Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. But going forward, we're going to use that 10 o'clock hour for people to, to connect, talk, and then we're going to have kind of a combined adult Sunday school lesson for a while as we assess where God is leading us and how we're going to reopen and reconvene and restructure what used to look like Sunday school, but now with so many people here, there, and yonder, we want to do it in a make sense way that really is a good stewardship of our teaching teams and, uh, and not just having one person sitting up on the third floor and two people on the second floor so we get together and have that, that work together. Also excited about July 14th, which is a Wednesday week from Wednesday, when we're going to be having a resuming of our uh, family night meal. And we want to get people to sign up as we used to do, so we have a number in mind. But also, uh, the meal's at 6, but deliveries, if, if you know someone who's shut in, if you know someone who's not going to be able to travel or is not, still not comfortable gathering in that kind of crowd, we want to start deliveries at 5 o'clock. But there's also an opportunity if you if you can come out but you didn't want to come in, we're going to have drive-through option. And I don't know if we're going to have a wait staff on, on on roller skates like Sonic yet. We're trying to work through that. I thought it'd be a cool thing anyway. I'll let you do that. You will let me do that. Me and my broken leg. That's right. <laughs> I'll just have one. But then, uh, but, but at 5:30 we'll be able to drive through as well. With that we want to know that. Uh, that you're coming. Uh, while we're no longer announcing specific prayer requests during uh, worship time because we want to acknowledge that there are privacy issues and there are privacy uh, requests from people, we have very active prayer warriors that receive weekly prayer notices. And those are held confidential, uh, confidentially and they're not shared in public, but if you have prayer needs, this is an incredibly powerful uh, praying church. And if you want to be added to our prayer ministry, then please text, email, leave a note in the offering plate so that we can add you or your loved one to our prayer ministry. We just want you to, to know that that's going on, even though we don't publish that in our chronicle anymore because of those privacy concerns. At this time, I would ask that we bow our heads and then we prepare our hearts for worship of the Holy Spirit ministering to us in preparation for our time of worship. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful for the power of your Spirit that has drawn us to this place this morning. We may think that we have just kind of come here happenstance, so we got up thinking, oh, let's go to church this morning. But we know that you draw us to you. And so 
we ask for the preparation of your Holy Spirit for this time of singing and praying to your glory and for a message we pray is honoring you. And that, Lord, you would speak to our hearts directly this morning a message, whether it's prayed or sung or spoken, but that message unto us that you want us to have and know about you. Because all of this is to your glory, all of this is to your praise, all of this is to your honor. And we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you're able, please stand as we sing together our hymn medley this morning.
force be with you. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> this morning, I, I've got um, a lot on my mind about today's preaching and teaching. And I asked Lee to put into the Chronicle uh, the prayer, the Lord's Prayer. And I'd like to introduce this to, to some of you. Maybe you remember from childhood. Some of you may have come from traditions where the Lord's Prayer is repeated every week. And you're really thinking about what's it we like it today while you're repeating that. Um, and that prayer. Because we, a lot of traditions, they, we, I grew up as a Methodist, and we would do this prayer all the time. And I would be thinking about the next thing rather than thinking really about addressing God. Because that's what can happen when you do things by rote over and over and over again. You forget about the reason or the connectedness. And so what I asked Lee to do was to actually put in the Lord's Prayer as it is found directly, there we go, as it is, you know, yeah, I just had to turn the microphone over. Uh, but I wanted, I wanted the prayer to be put in just as Jesus had put it as recorded by Matthew. And it'll sound odd to you because in the context of Matthew, the disciple who was following Jesus, who had been a tax collector, the specific occasion was this. Lord, teach us to pray. You see, they saw a connection between Jesus' life this way to live with his prayer life with the Father and his empowerment to live vertically and horizontally as he did miracles in his preaching and teaching. So they saw this connection of his prayer life and the power for living. And they, as disciples, have all the ministerial functions you would think they didn't ask him, Lord, teach us how to run a committee. <laughs> or Lord, teach us how to do a capital campaign. No, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he said, when you pray, pray like this. Let's pray this together. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. How many of you could have prayed this in the King James language? Our Father who art, hallowed be thy. Has anybody been in the food line lately and someone says, give me thy bread that I must, that thou must give us to me as I pay us my bill? Nobody talks like that anymore. And did you notice the word debt? I'll get to that in just a minute. But it, is, it, it just occurred to me that over and over and over in the last few years that when we've talked about freedom on Memorial Day or July 4th, uh, when we've celebrated Veterans Days and all, we, we talk a lot about the freedoms and the responsibilities that we as people have, have been given. But this, this week, particularly, as I have been on the road back and forth to Marshville, and, or through Marshville, I did stop once at Bojangles, or as my, one of my friends from Greenville, South Carolina, called it Bohungalese. And I'm so sad that they don't do the cheddar bows anymore. But that's another story. I go through Marshville a lot right now. And why is this on my mind right now? Because as I go through Marshville these days, for the last two and a half, almost three weeks, 
J.C.'s Jewelry, Pawn, and Gun Shop that's on the right if you're going into, into Marshville. Has, it reminds me, every time I go through Marshville, it reminds me about Waysboro. And why is that? If you go by J.C.'s Jewelry, Gun, and Pawn Shop, on a daily basis, you will see the word Waitsboro at the bottom of their big marquee sign. You know the kind of sign I'm talking about where you get the big block letters and you put them in there and there's a message board and it, it tells you, you see them at Ingalls, you see them at, at Food Line, you see them at Walmart, or gas stations, you know, they put the big letters up there to change the signs. Well, at JC's Jewelry, Pawn, and Gun Shop, for the last three weeks, it has bad check. And then when they're open, well, let me do Bad check blank, Wadesboro, $2,600. And when I first saw it, and I don't know who this person is, but when I first saw the big sign at JC's, Jewelry gun and pawn shop. It had bad check, and this person, Pandora Harris. I don't know who she is. Apparently, she's from the Wadesboro area. But JC's has a thing against her. She's at least being accused of having passed a bad check for $2,600. And every day at the beginning, there were smears of, I don't know if it was food or something up on the sign, and then the letters were torn down, and then there was a rock or something thrown through the sign, and there was a hole in it. So I guess JC's jewelry, gun, and pawn shop decided we're only going to put up her name during business hours so that we can see what's happening. So every day during business hours, Bad check, this woman's name, Wadesboro, $2,600. Somebody owes somebody something. And I don't know the truth of it. I don't know the circumstances around it. All I know is that at JC's jewelry gun and pawn shop, there's something going on. And somebody feels very strongly that they are owed something. And there's someone who feels equally as strong that I don't want my name up on 74 with both lanes of traffic seeing my name in eight inch letters associated with a bad check from Waynesboro for $2,600. Somebody owes somebody something. I don't know who she is. don't know the story. Somebody owes something. Carla and I love to read signs going down the road when we're traveling. And two weeks ago, we saw a, a tow truck that I just, I love the tagline. And maybe you've seen it around Union County because it hangs out around Union County. You've seen it a lot around. But it's a tow truck, apparently it's a tow truck that has a very specific purpose. It has a very, it's a niche market. This particular tow truck, I think, is filling. And it's a, I think it belongs to a repo company because the tagline on the tow trucks is, we, <laughs> we reap what you owe. <laughs> I thought, that is clever. I, I think that's one of the most clever little taglines I have seen. We reap what you owe. Somebody owes something. When Jesus was teaching on prayer, he was addressing his disciples' direct and specific need. Dr. Luke records a few more words in that teaching, but the essence, the skeleton, the, 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 the pithiness of Matthew's version, I think, speaks directly to, we have a relationship with the Father, we have a relationship with God, whether we realize, realize it or not, that we've been created and that God is to be honored, or hallowed, God is to be honored, God is to be respected, 
And Jesus is saying, when you pray, remember this, that you're dependent on him. Our Father. Notice the collective sense of that. Not just my Father. We sometimes want to get so personal with our, our language that we forget that God is the one who created all humanity. God is the God of all nations. God is the God of all people. God is the God of all creation. And this is something that we sometimes lose, but Jesus calls us back to that recognition that we are inextricably bound. We are knit together. We're in a tapestry of destiny together. And so that when we pray together, we, we, he's, he's calling us into community to recognize our Father needs to be honored. Our Father needs to be respected. Our Father is worthy of praise. Our Father was in heaven. Not just earthbound, not contained in a little statue, not contained in an idol, not contained in one geo specific location that is bordered by oceans, that God is in heaven, that God is the one who's going to pour out God's spirit, that his son is, is the one who's praying, saying God needs to be honored and God is in heaven. But God knows your specific need. So you can be specific with your needs this morning. You can say, Lord, we need to eat tomorrow. And literally, the Greek construction of that sentence about daily bread is, Lord, give us tomorrow's bread. Not just our daily bread, but give us tomorrow's bread. But here's the one I wanted to center in on. Dead. Because the, 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 the Greek word here is ophalema, ophalema. And it, it is literally a legal owing. It is a legal bond of what is justly owed. And I'm not really sure. I tried to trace it back. Where did we get the notion of trespass from? Because most of us grew up saying, forgive us our what? Trespasses. And those who have trespassed against us. Now I'm a country boy. I grew up in the country. And trespass to me means you have crossed a boundary that I told you not to cross. I posted a sign. I put up a fence. I didn't put a gate on that fence. I posted this as a boundary don't cross it. If you do, you are trespassing. And I got to thinking about that. I trespass all the time and don't even know it. I cross boundaries, sometimes my language, sometimes my habits. I'll cross a boundary, but I don't think very much of it. I'll go, oh, I crossed that line. Let me come back over here. And it's like, okay, no big deal. Trespasses. You know, if I come up with Leave, thou hast trespassed against me. Does that carry a lot of weight? Or does that, it doesn't really land very well. And so going back to the original, I thought it was very powerful to understand. Most of us really do understand debt. That stuff which is justly and legally owed. As a young gentleman out of seminary early in the early 80s, I got my first credit card and I felt powerful. How many of you remember those days? I got my first, it was a Phillips 66. It wasn't even a master card. I got a Phillips 66 card. I, I can buy gas when I have no money and I can keep riding when I have no money. And then I got my first MasterCard. I can buy stereo equipment when I have no money. And I found out really quickly that my appetite was bigger than my resources. Anybody been in there? <laughs> I can just go get stuff. It's like Amazon before Amazon. I can just get stuff and I've got it. And oh, rats the bill shows up and suddenly 
I'm not feeling so free anymore. <laughs> you, you can't take it all back. The point is this. Most of us understand debt more than we do trespassing. That we owe somebody, that there's something that we're obligated to pay. Or somebody might come up in a truck that says, we, we reap what you owe. And the repo guy shows up. Thankfully, I've never had that experience. But I sure have dug myself into holes early in life before I figured all that stuff that you have to actually pay stuff back that it took me years to get out of. I hate debt now. I hate it. Because what I see debt as is I'm tied to something or to someone like a bank or an institution. I'm tied to them in a way that I don't want to be obligated to them. How many of you ever had the, the exhilarating experience of actually paying off your car? <laughs> I don't know that sound much, but yes, I don't have a car payment. So now let me go buy more stuff. We've been working diligently over the years to get out of debt so that now the only debt we have is a mortgage payment. And that's free. Now why is that free? Because every one of us need margin. Every family needs margin. We need, in order to be free and not just working to pay something off, to be a slave to the bank, a slave to the car company, or a slave to the credit card company, we need margin. Otherwise, you're just a slave. Jesus knew this, but he also knew it's not just money that will keep us or create debt. And we know this is something from our language. How many of us have said, hey man, I owe you one. You ever had anybody say that or you said that to anybody? Hey, I, you know, hey, I owe you one. Or have you ever said to someone else, hey, I took one for the team, you owe me. I did that recently. And y'all really owe me now. Or maybe you said, Thank you, I'm in your debt. Hmm. Or maybe you said, you owe me an apology. You owe me an apology. You see, there's a, there's a way that we create debt. In the church, we use the old language, we call it sin is when we've stolen something from somebody, it might be honor, it might be credit, it may be integrity, it may, that we, it may be that we have in some way lodged a complaint against one of God's creatures and for whom Jesus died and we've done so wrongfully or willfully or out of anger, but now we've created a debt relationship. And when we sin against each other, we create debt relationship. And Jesus said, forgive us our debts, not just our monetary debts, not the ones that keep us in bondage to institutions to which we justly owe, but also the debts that we have created because of our willfulness, our forgetfulness, our anger, or whatever against each other. But guess what? The debt that that creates with God. because of our broken relationship with, with God. And maybe we don't think of our relationships like that, but that's why Jesus is teaching us a deep, deep teaching about relationships and how we create debt relationships because of the brokenness of the way we live our lives a lot of times. How many of you have ever felt the pain of guilt over what you did or didn't do as a parent. <laughs> and if, you, if there's not some of that there, or if, let me put it in a positive, if there is some of that there, you get what I'm talking about, you feel like you owe somebody something that you can't make up. 
You've heard me talk about living as a, as a single dad with three girls, and you've heard about those uh, painful moments in, during Father's Day when I was sharing that I didn't think I was much of a, you know, a good parent. I was just trying to do what I could. But there, there have been times in my life that I was so plagued or feeling such a death load to my failures as a parent that I didn't know what to do with the guilt because of the debt that I could not pay because it was done. And this is, the, this is the bondage that a lot of us live in. When we have things in our past for which we cannot go back and change, it is done, it is done, it is done, and now we're, we're trying to live and trying to pay off some debt that we feel like we owe to somebody, maybe to a parent, even to God. Lord, I know I've crossed this line, trespass, trespass, but what I'm really feeling is that, that I have such a burden of debt with you that I can't never repay that I don't, I'm not going to go to church anymore. I just I don't feel like I can pay the debt anymore. I, or I go to church, but I'm not going to get involved in because I don't want people to know that I feel this debt or have been carrying this feeling of debt. And here's the good news. When Jesus begins to teach us, forgive us our debts, Lord, as we forgive those who are debtors, the people who owe us. Now think about that a minute. Who right now comes to mind when I say, who's hurt your feelings? Who do you feel like owes you something? An apology or something? Money? <laughs> Who do you in your life, come, who comes to your mind when I say, oh, yeah, that person, those people, yeah, they owe me. I want you to see what Jesus is doing here. Lord, forgive us our debts. As we forgive those who owe us. And linking those together. Oh, my goodness, now... Oh, Lord Jesus, you're going from preaching to meddling. I like carrying my grudges. <laughs> I like carrying this feeling that somebody owes me something. I, like, I kind of nurture that sometimes, Lord. I don't want to just give that up and give it over. But let me show you how it practically works. If you go to Colossians 2, Paul makes this clear connection that he's received from Jesus when he says... When we, you and me, were living a life that was apart from God, he uses the word uncircumcised. When we were living apart from the promise of God, Christ died for us and he took our debts. I want you to think about this. If you have ever bought a home or a car, you get paperwork that shows you what you owe. And you may have had in the old days a payment book. Boy, that's a long time ago. I'm gonna rip off one of these payment slips, put a check in the mail, and send it. Paul says, what Jesus has done on the cross is he has taken the very documents of your indebtedness of what you owe to him, to God, to each other. He has taken the legal document of debt and he has nailed it to the cross. It says you don't owe anybody anymore because I've paid it. You see how this debt concept starts to make sense when you say Jesus paid it all? That it's not just a trespass. It's not just a backsliding, but there's a debt relationship that needs to be paid off, that needs to be resolved and paid in full. I don't know about y'all, but when I've had bills paid for me, it's the most humbling and exhilarating feeling. In, in 86, I had kidney stones, and 
I had to go to the hospital several times. I had to have procedures and lithotripsy and all these things. I went to Methodist Hospital in Savannah, and I had to have several stays. And all I could see in my head was a mounting list of bills. And all I could see was the, the thousands of dollars adding up. And, and if you've ever had long-term health issues, you know how that stuff begins to, to, you just get bills. You get an explanation on benefits and they don't match up. And, and I just started feeling really, really depressed about it. Until one day, the finance administrator walked in because I'd shared with my nurse. I said, I can even talk to somebody about what we owe. I, I, don't, I don't know what we're gonna do here. And she sent the person from the finance office up. And this woman just very she was gently, she took my hand and she said, Harry, you're, you're a Methodist pastor. Your stay is covered. Because it was a Methodist <coughs> hospital. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And all of a sudden, all I could feel was this freedom and this this relief that my debt had been paid. When we are celebrating today's Freedom Day, your debt has been paid. Now act like it, spread it on, and, and, and rejoice in the freedom that God is giving us because of what Christ has done to release us from the prison of debt to each other, to God. And maybe even from your own appetites that are creating some financial debts as well. This is the Spirit of God, I pray, that sends upon us today. As you go out, I want you to go eat watermelon, I want you to eat barbecue, I want you to eat whatever you want to do, but do so in the freedom and knowing that Christ has paid your debt and we owe a debt to so many who have given the ultimate price for our lives in this country. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks and praise for who you are. We thank you for teaching us that we are connected to you and to each other in a way that binds us indebtedness, but also a release of freedom and forgiveness. We give you thanks and praise and glory. In Jesus' name.